I think what great franchise systems, franchisors and franchisees realize is that in a word, the way they both make money is cooperation. Because if the franchisor helps the franchisee run a more profitable business, that franchisee will reinvest in growth. It'll drive the top line. More people will join the franchise. It'll drive the top line. Franchisor will have more resources to invest in profit. It creates a virtuous cycle if it's viewed through cooperation. The following is brought to you by Thrive, the end-to-end client experience platform that helps you get the job, manage the job, and get credit. Welcome to Winning on Main Street. I'm Gordon Henry. Each week at Winning on Main Street, we speak with a great entrepreneur. And today we're speaking with Mike Skitsky. Mike's resume reads like a history of franchise in the United States. For decades, he's played a key role at regional and national franchises, including the Belfour Franchise Group, a large disaster restoration company which owned the franchise chains Hoods and Ducks. Then Mike moved on to Title Boxing Club, And now, Franworth, which is a company that builds franchise systems. Mike's partners there at Franworth include John Rachi, who was on our show recently, and an investor you may have heard of named Drew Brees. Yes, that Drew Brees. Welcome, Mike. Hello, Gordon. Thanks for having me. Awesome to have you. So, Mike, I'm really excited to talk about your amazing career. You've really done a lot in the franchising space. How'd you get into franchising and why'd you find it to be a good career path? Well, yeah, great question. And I I would love to tell you that it was part of uh, just a a great master plan hatched at birth, but it was uh, a little bit accidental. So uh, out of uh, out of college, armed with my English degree from Ohio State University, I, like a lot of good arts and science majors, went to work for Enterprise Rent-A-Car and uh, learned a tremendous amount about organizational management and sales and, and really loved my time there. Got promoted pretty quickly into the fleet services division. And through that, we helped businesses manage fleets of cars. And I met a fellow who was a franchisee. His name was Dane Benson. He owned a Mr. Handyman franchise here in Michigan. And Dane and I went to lunch to talk about his fleet. And he was so excited. He had just bought this new business. And he and his wife were starting out in a new chapter of their life. And he needed help managing his fleet. And his fleet had two vans. And I said, Dan, I said, I, I hate to tell you, but that's that's smaller than the normal fleet. That's, you know, normally we do dozens or hundreds of vans. I said, I'd, I'd love to help you. I'm so excited for what you're doing, but you only have two vans. And he said, well, gosh, that's a shame. He says, you know, there's a franchisee down the road in Detroit with two vans, and there's another one in Toledo with two vans, and there's one in Cleveland with two vans. I said, well, Dane, I said, I, I have two questions for you. Um, what's a franchise and how many of you are there? Mm-hmm. And uh, Dane pretty quickly explained that there were 100 Mr. Handyman franchisees, uh, all with two vans. And he talked about how they you know, worked together as a, a system. And I met the, the folks at Service Brands International, the parent company for that franchise. And long story short, put together a, a fleet program. And my life began or became working with all of these franchise owners uh, through Mr. Handyman all over the country. And where before I was helping... CFOs improve their lease rates and shave half a point off one line on a P&L. Now, all of a sudden, I was helping families start small businesses, create jobs, invest in their communities. And I, I just fell in love with franchising. And the founder of Service Brands, David McKinnon, um, uh, noticed me, took a liking to me, for whatever reason, took me under his wing and gave me a desk ultimately at Service Brands and started to mentor me and, and really taught me the, the the franchising business. And uh, I've, I've never I've never looked back. It's uh, all about building personal relationships. And I just I just fell in love with the industry. Yeah. I heard that a little later in your career uh, when you were at Title Boxing, uh, Tom Monahan, the founder of Domino's, stopped by. I know Tom was a sort of connection of yours, and uh, he dropped by the club. And uh, you had a pretty interesting story to tell about his visit there. Can you share? 
I, I did. I'd, I'd be happy to. And it's it's interesting. I've been you know really blessed in my life. The, the International Franchise Association recognizes one entrepreneur of the year um, uh, per year. Only one person in all the franchising. There's a few dozen of these guys uh, and, and 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 ladies around the country. Um, one of them was David McKinnon, who I mentioned, who was an early mentor to me. Another, John Rachi, who you mentioned earlier, my longtime you know friend and and mentor. Both of whom really kind of poured into my life. John worked for Tom Monahan, the founder of Domino's Pizza, and Tom was a great mentor to to John. So I spent much of my career working with John, hearing stories of what would Tom Monahan do? How would Tom Monahan solve this problem? You know what Mr. Monahan, you know, would would say and uh, learned so much of how Mr. Monahan thought about franchising through through John. So when we fast forward to Title Boxing Club, we're helping expand uh, Title uh, across the country. We're just launching from a regional brand to uh, a national brand. Uh, John is you know, president of Title Boxing Club at, at the time, uh, and I'm working as, as John's right-hand guy. And John, very excited about Title, invites his mentor, Mr. Monahan, to um, into our Title Boxing Club to show him what what we're doing. And Mr. Monahan comes along uh, with uh, you know a, a few folks on, on on his team, and all of a sudden, here is mentor to my mentor, icon of franchising, um, you know, standing you know inside of our our little Title Boxing Club. And John gives me a quick elbow, and he says, "Go ask Mr. Monahan a question." And I thought, oh, oh my gosh, um, I should have thought of this in advance. I didn't really have something prepared. So I've got about four steps from myself to Mr. Monahan. I'm trying to think of something that'll sound really smart. And I come up with this big, long, convoluted question around Mr. Monahan. We're expanding title from a regional to a national brand. And I know you've always focused on the importance of having a single product in your business. And how should I you know, scale the brand without losing consent? And I just went on and on and on. <laughs> and Mr. Monahan just stood there. He didn't turn his head. He didn't flinch. He didn't move. He just stood with his hands in his pockets. And I thought, oh my God, I blew it. That was a dumb question. He's not even going to look at me. And and then I start wondering, like, well, maybe it's loud in here. Maybe he didn't hear me. Maybe I should report, repeat the, the, the long question. And the moment goes by and it felt like an eternity. But what I realized was that Mr. Monahan was actually looking around, you know, Title Boxing Club and was looking at the, the class that was going on. And Rachel, who was a, a med student at, at U of M, who was teaching the class, she was also in the boxing club. He's watching Rachel teach and he's looking at the, 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 the monitors and the timers and just everything that's happening. And finally, he kind of looks at me and he shrugs and he goes, well, your products and experience and this is all great. So just do this every time. And he walked away. <laughs> and I, I don't know exactly what I was expecting. I think maybe, I, I, I don't know if I thought he'd pull out like this big leather bound book and say, well, Michael, here are the secrets of franchise. But he said, just do this every time. And uh, I was, I was kind of bummed, but the more I thought about it, and then when I talked with John about it, you know, he said, well, gosh, that's the brilliance of Tom you know, being so direct because really when you think about it, to be great at a franchise or to be great at any, any business, if you know what your core is, if you can boil it down to one sentence, and for title, it's delivering a great experience, and then you just do that every single time, um, it really becomes a great lens to look at your whole business through. So, um, yeah, great learning from Tom, and that became really the, 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 the backbone of the support infrastructure and the operations teams and all the resources we built together at Title. Great. So I want to get a little nerdy on you for a minute here. You're, you're a real expert at franchise. Right. I think a lot of the people who listen to this program uh, may be deciding, do I go down the franchising route? Do I go open up my own independent small business? And so I'd like to sort of understand the economics of franchising. And who better to tell about us than tell it to us than you? So real simple, how do franchisors make money and how do franchisees make money? Got it. Franchisors make money off the top line. So a franchisor charges a royalty. It's, per, it's a percentage of the revenue generated by the franchisee. So the more sales, the more royalty, uh, the healthier the franchisor. The franchisee, like any small business, makes money off the bottom line. They need to run a profitable small business. 
Now, the real answer to that question, though, I think what great franchise systems, franchisors and franchisees realize is that in a word, the way they both make money is cooperation. Because if the franchisor helps the franchisee run a more profitable business, that franchisee will reinvest in growth. It'll drive the top line. More people will join the franchise. It'll drive the top line. Franchisor will have more resources to invest in profit. It creates a virtuous cycle mm. if it's viewed through cooperation. You know, in our world of small independent businesses, you know, many are struggling, particularly with COVID, but many have been struggling. Uh, you know, there's a high failure rate of small independent businesses. It seems to me as an outsider that franchises are everywhere. I mean, everywhere you look in Main Street after Main Street, you see franchises. Are franchises exploding and doing really well, or is that like not true and a misperception? And I, I think, you know, franchises, you know, are, are everywhere. Um, there's over 750,000 franchise establishments in the U.S. Uh, franchises contribute almost $500 billion to the U.S. GDP every year, uh, employ almost 8.5 million people. So there are franchises everywhere, but every single one of those franchises are in independently owned and operated local small business with somebody, you know, a, a family uh, standing behind that business, risking capital, doing the same things any small business owner are are doing. I think what you know what helps franchising is that in a franchise system, you have a whole network of other franchisees that you can rely on, and together, I think in any walk of life, together. All of us are a heck of a lot smarter than one of us. And when you have friends and colleagues trying to solve the same problems, sharing ideas and best practices, and a franchisor facilitating that, and again, back to that idea of cooperation, um, you know, it's kind of the old adage, many hands make light work, and you get, uh, you know, that plays out in franchising. Right. You mentioned the risking capital part. How much capital does a franchisee have to risk to get started? And how does that compare to uh, starting your own small independent business, do you think? Got it. So franchises are across nearly every every industry in in the U.S. So uh, at the the high end of the spectrum, you know, restaurants or you know, hotels in the hospitality industry, that's a large, that's a significant in, investment. Um, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, there's many small home based service businesses that uh, a person could start for you know, tens of, of thousands of dollars. Um, there are programs like the Vet Fran uh, program through the International Franchise Association that can provide you know discounts to um, you know certain folks who, who qualify. So it's a very it can be a very accessible business. Um, it's also a very very you know big you know business. Um, the a franchisee will typically pay a franchise fee to the franchisor kind of like the cover charge to become a part of the system. So the franchisor's job is to make sure that they provide enough value to justify that as opposed to someone going out on their own. And does a franchisee usually get a territory? Depends on the type of business. Some franchise uh, systems are built around uh, territories. So in a brand like Title Boxing Club that we were talking about earlier, there's a physical location and there's a territory around that location. So franchisees can cooperate without you know bumping too much uh, into each other. Uh, there are other businesses that you know, don't lend themselves to, to territories. It really depends on the business model. Right. So it sounds to me like maybe there's more of an initial capital outlay by the franchisee than might be required in your own small independent business, because in your own small independent business, a lot of people just start working, you know, kind of their own two hands depends obviously a lot on the business, but they don't have to pay an upfront free fee to get started other than whatever tools they may need. I mean, obviously, it depends on the kind of a business you're in. Yeah, I think for you, if we were comparing, you know, two, you know, an independent business and a franchise business in the same industry, one is not better or worse. One is not right or wrong. I think the the difference is in a franchise, you're paying a franchise fee and there's training and learning that comes along with that. So hopefully the goal would be you could build that business quicker. If you're starting out independently, you're not paying a franchise fee. But if you make a couple of mistakes along the way, I know a lot of small business owners who will say, gosh, if I only knew then what I knew now, I never would have spent money on what have you. 
a franchise can be a little bit of a crystal ball and help you avoid, you know, some of that. At the end of the day, plenty of healthy small businesses and franchise systems. I think it depends a lot on you know, someone's personality and how entrepreneurial mm. they are because a franchise also comes along with rules and systems. For some people, that's really comforting and it's a great fit. Some people want to make everything up on their own. They're true, true entrepreneurs and that's okay too, but a franchise might drive them crazy. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what are the key traits that make uh, a successful franchisee? And it sounds like you're sort of saying that some of those who are maybe truly entrepreneurial want to kind of write their own script. Maybe they should go the independent route. Somebody who likes the structure uh, maybe would do better on the franchise side. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a good way to paraphrase. I mean, in a, a franchise, one of the uh, you know things you'll hear a lot of franchise you know owners talk about is you're in business for yourself, but you're not in business by yourself. And if that sounds like a good thing, having some systems to follow, some colleagues to collaborate with, um, you know, a path to, to 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 walk while still very much making your own decisions and leading your own day to day you're a great fit for a, for a franchise. If you really want to create something unique from the ground up, and it's a special kind of person who wants to do that, that's fabulous. But then a franchise would feel kind of restrictive. Right. Now you've, you've talked before, I've heard you talk about this magic number of 100 franchises in a franchise system. Like that seems to be where franchises become really successful and they bust through that 100 unit mark. Why is that important? Um, great, great question. So for a, a franchisor, you know, building out a, a network of franchisees, when that business begins franchising, they've entered a whole new business. And now they need to, that franchisor is, has agreed to provide branding and training and marketing and systems and support to all of their franchisees. And that, that comes at a cost. And the more franchisees that you add, the more training and support and systems and people and, and infrastructure you need to um, be able to you know provide what 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 they're looking for. So for most franchisors, as a rough rule of thumb, um, once you reach that hundred unit mark, a franchise system can be royalty self-sufficient. It means that that money coming off the top line, that ongoing fee, is enough to pay for all the infrastructure and the support to keep those franchisees happy and healthy and growing. Now, sometimes that can come sooner or later, depending on average unit volumes and all kinds of factors that I, I won't geek out on too much here. But the point being is a, a franchising is really a game of, of scale and of growth and of grabbing market share. Right. Uh, so I want to turn a little bit more to you personally and your career and how you've succeeded. Uh, and one of the things that's really impressive is that you took a lot of franchises that were local or regional and you expanded them, you scaled them to your point just now, and you took them national, like title boxing, I think you did that. Um, how did you make that happen? How did, you, how did you take something that was smaller and just explode it the way you did? Well, you know, Gordon, I'll tell you, it was, um, you know, in, in each of those instances, truly a team effort. And I think through, throughout the, the, the course of my career, uh, what I'm most grateful for is just that people have had the opportunity to, to work with and the long-term relationships, because a lot of those, you know, successes, whether title or, or other brands, there's a, there's a similar team of people and a similar cast of, of characters um, who've helped us, you know, solve problems and, and really grow, you know, grow together. So, um I mean, the, the short answer is just an, an amazing team of people. But but structurally, the way that the way that we we came at it is in in any emerging franchise brand. I would argue that you've you've got to be good at two things, whatever the core business is, um, and being the business of a franchisor. So when we met Danny Campbell, who's one of the co-founders of Title Boxing Club, Danny was a retired boxer, had a real heart for the the fitness of boxing. He wanted to bring boxing to the masses, use a boxer's workout for fitness, not fighting. Um, and and that's that was just what Danny was all about. But once he had 10 or 11 title boxing club franchises open, Danny's life was more about franchise sales, hosting discovery days, 
fixing, um, uh, real estate concerns, uh, all the things that go into managing a franchise business. Our team was able to come in, allow Danny to focus in on the core business, and then we were focused in on the franchise systems and infrastructure. And together, through recognizing that there's a core business and a business of franchising, both of those need to be staffed, both of those need to be funded, both of those need to work in concert, you know, then it was just a matter of, you know, laying out a great plan, executing on it, and we were able to uh, enjoy some great success. Speaking of your team, you've worked alongside John Rachi for many years now. Your careers, to some extent, have paralleled each other. Uh, you know, I, I, I think of you guys as kind of the Lennon and McCartney of franchising. You know, you've, you've got all the hits. And uh, I was wondering, how are you and John different? What, what, why is this a good partnership? What, how, how do you differ and how are you, dissim- you know, similar? Oh, the Lennon and McCartney. I, well, you don't want to hear either of us sing, so I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. We, um, I'll tell you, John and I have enjoyed a, a long relationship. We've worked together for fifteen, probably coming up on twenty years now. Um, and you know, John is very much a, a, a visionary. You know, John is able to see you know, what, what can be, he's the eternal optimist. He's able to, to cast a vision and build a team and, you know, bring people, you know, align people around, you know, that, that, that vision. And for much of my career, I worked alongside John as more of the, the implementer. So able to see what the picture on the top of the puzzle box looks like, but also how to put all of those, all of those pieces, you know, together. So, you know, John would say, let's do this. And I would say, great, how? And, you know, we would would, would challenge each other and there was always a, a healthy tension there. Uh, but John and I are, you know, truly friends. So, um, you know, that, you know, that helps. I think we, you know, each of us respects the other. Um, we enjoy not only working together and building business and the, the, the business of franchising, um, you know, we're both runners. We enjoy, you know, lunchtime runs, you know, together. I think John and I would, you know, be friends even if we didn't work together. So having that complementary skill set and um, uh, also that, that friendship, you know, really helps. Now, I'll tell you, the interesting thing that's happened over the years is, I was asked this question a little while ago at a, a reception of some franchisees, and I described, you know, John's roles I just did to you, and mine is more of implementing. And one of my VPs was standing next to me, and he's kind of scratching his head. And I said, Aaron, what's, what's the matter? And he goes, he shrugged his shoulders. He goes, I don't know. He goes, if you would have asked me that question, I would have said, you kind of set vision and tell us which way to go. And I help implement and put all of the pieces together. Mm-hmm. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. And over the years with John really investing in me and pouring into me and, you know, and coaching me, you know, I, I think my leadership style has evolved, you know, more, you know, toward that, that visionary, you know, style. And, you know, John's helped me you know, find opportunities to, to lead brands myself. And I've been really, you know, grateful, you know, for that. So it's, yeah, you know, it's certainly evolved over over the years. That's great. Uh, we're just going to take a really quick break, Mike, and we'll be back. I want to ask you about your book uh, that you wrote with John Reach. Thank you. Looking for that extra spark of inspiration to take your business to the next level? Thrive, the leading software for small business, presents Connect Twenty. The year's number one interactive conference for entrepreneurs like yourself will feature some of today's most successful business leaders, industry pioneers, and technology gurus. Hear from a lineup of inspirational speakers, including Scott Galloway, the star of Vice TV's No Mercy, No Malice, and best-selling author of The Four and the Algebra of Happiness. Well-renowned CEOs, successful Shark Tank contestants, and savvy business experts will also be offering must-have advice. You'll have the opportunity to participate in scheduled educational breakout sessions with leading executives from Yelp, Lendio, Neighborly, and more. Network with small business resources like America's Small Business Development Centers, SCORE, and the National Women's Business Council, as well as with other owners just like you. So grab a cup of coffee and join us for this virtual online event, November 10th and 11th. This is the small business conference you won't want to miss. Register now at thrive.com slash connect. That's T-H-R-Y-V dot com slash connect. Come to connect, leave inspired.
All right, we're back with Mike Skitsky, and we were just talking about his relationship with John Rachi. Uh, you guys wrote a book together, uh, which I listened to as an audio book, was great, called Reach. Why don't you tell folks uh, who are listening, what, what was the book about? What was the, what was the point of that book? Absolutely. So reach is, is was really about the, the importance of, of human connections. Um, you know, John and I, both of us have had a, a number of, of great mentors in, in our lives. And, and, and John in particular has had just some, some iconic leaders come into his life and pour into him and invest into him. So reach was really a, you know, a story and a celebration of, of mentorship. Uh, it's about reaching out to find a mentor. It's about reaching high for inspirational goals and then reaching back to be a mentor to someone else. Right. And writing a book together, tell me a little bit about that. What, what's, what's it like to co-author a book? Must be an interesting process. Any, any tricks or tips? You know, it, it was an interesting process, and I tell you, all of a sudden, late in my career, that English degree came came in handy in a way I never, <laughs> I never thought it would. Um, you know, I had spent you know so many years with John, um, hearing John's stories, and and John is a you know if you know John, you know he's a wonderful, wonderful you know storyteller, and you know can can share a story and and um, you know also share a you know a moral or a lesson or a learning that that he took that he took from it. Um, so I. I knew so many of, of John's stories and, and the content and the way that we really worked together in, in writing the book was that John, John was able to provide, you know, this, this wealth of, of life experiences and mentoring relationships he'd had with uh, Bo Schembechler, legendary coach at U of M and Tom Monahan, the founder of Domino's Pizza. And, uh, John too was very close with David McKinnon, the founder of Service Brands. John could share all of that content. Uh, and I was able to help put that together through, um, you know, into a bit of a, a story arc. And then for each of, you know, John's, you know, stories, I wrote an application of how we took the learning from that story and applied it to one of the businesses that we had, had worked on over the years. So the writing process itself really kind of mirrored our relationship, you know, overall, you know, of John providing, you know, great, you know, great vision, great leadership, you know, learnings from these great experiences. Um, and then I was, you know, more kind of putting pieces uh, together and, um, you know, talking about how we, we applied it in, uh, in our day to day. That's uh, fantastic. You, you, the book talks a lot about mentorship, and you mentioned some of uh, John's uh, mentors, very famous people. Uh, anybody uh, on your mentor list, me people who mentored you, other than the names you've already mentioned? Well, you know, good, uh, you know, good, good, good question. Um, yeah, some some great folks we we've talked about here all, already. I'll tell you, it's never, you know, it's never too late in your life to, to have a mentor. And maybe sometimes I think we, you know, we think back to who were mentors or early in our life, but uh, very recently um, I've enjoyed a, a great mentoring relationship with a fellow named Tito Diaz. I met Tito through, uh, through, through my church. He's one of the pastors there. He's recently um, uh, planted a church in Michigan called Riza uh, himself uh, and he's been a great uh, mentor uh, to me, um, and I've been able to help, you know, also coach Tito um, uh, on uh, some of the the, the startup needs. Uh, you know, it ends up that uh, starting a church uh, in some ways is fairly similar to starting a franchise. Uh, so uh, we've been been able to be great mentors to one another. That's awesome. Uh, I want to turn a little bit uh, to your current business, Franworth. Uh, just tell us, you know, what does Franworth do? It's not exactly a franchise in the traditional sense, right? But it is all about creating franchises. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Franworth really does uh, does this three things, uh, and, and we are you know, Franworth has assembled a, a team with about 450 years of franchise uh, experience, um, and, and that team helps to do three things. Uh, one, we, we operate franchise brands uh, in which we're we're invested. Uh, number two, we help build franchise systems. Uh, so we'll work with uh, with a founder or with uh, with an organization. Uh, we're doing this right now for um, for Hershey and for um, uh, a Berkshire Hathaway brand, helping to build the franchise system for those clients. 
And then number three, we provide related services that leverage uh, economies of scale and improve efficiencies for franchisors and other businesses. So we have uh, uh, a purchasing arm, uh, which can help provide supplies to franchisees. And we have a service arm called Fran Works, which can provide back office services to uh, small businesses. And how do you find the franchises? Are they? I mean, you mentioned Hershey's and Berkshire Hathaway. Those are two giant companies. They found you somehow, probably. Um, do people just kind of find you? How do you connect with potential customers of yours or, or members of the firm? Got it. Great, great, great question. Um, you know, a, a lot is through you know personal relationship and and, and reputation. Um, you know our you know the the partners in Franworth, John Ronchi, David Barr, Dave Kyle, Drew Brees uh, have been I think so purposeful and, and careful to be just stand up leaders and uh you know have built a reputation deservedly of uh you know you know doing what they say following through and with that reputation comes you know great relationships and great uh, opportunities so we've been fortunate as an organization to not have to do a tremendous amount of of outbound you know marketing um but to be able to be you know somewhat selective and look for organizations and you know and founders who really share um you know share a vision for you know building you know systems uh uh, collaboratively and, uh, you know, keeping your know, franchisee needs first and foremost. And we've been able to uh, strike up some great partnerships. Great. We just have a couple of minutes left. A uh, quick question. I, I can't leave without asking about sure. Drew, Drew Brees, a uh, guy we've all seen on TV for years and years. Uh, you know, one of the truly great athletes of our time. What's like, what's it like to work with a guy like that? Yep. So I've, I've had, uh, you know, some opportunity to, to, to work with, uh, with, with Drew. I, I first uh, met Drew. I was uh, uh, speaking at our supplier summit at, at Franworth and uh, uh, Drew uh, attended and he, he sat in the front row and was taking notes. And I've never been so nervous in, in my life. I thought, oh my God, Drew, <laughs> Drew Brees is writing down something I, I, I said. I hope I don't uh, say something silly. Um, but Drew is such a, uh, he's such a student. He's uh, a student of of franchising, um, really, really loves the business world, the franchising world. Uh, he's a lifelong uh, learner. One of the the more humble folks that um, you know that, that, that I've ever I've, I've, I've ever you know met or, or worked with. Um, and he's able to apply a lot of the things that have made him a great leader on the field and in the locker room. Uh, also, you know, make him a great you know leader in in the boardroom. He's been able to you know you know, translate those those learnings um, you know really uh, really well. Hmm. Great. That must be fun to uh, work with a guy like that. So, uh, in our last couple of minutes here, just a couple of quick personal questions. So, you got a tremendous resume, sure. tremendous career path, uh, great people you've been around. Um, what should people know about Mike Skitsky that's not obvious from the resume? What What's the little secrets we should know? Uh, that's a that's a fun uh, that's a fun question. You know, I, I don't know if it's obvious from the the resume or not, but I'll, I'll tell you what I what I really really love doing professionally or personally is if if I can help someone, if I can encourage someone to do something that they didn't think they could do on their own, um, I just find that in, incredibly incredibly rewarding. So franchising is one way I'm, I'm able to do that. If you know, so many people have said, "Gosh, I've always wanted to start a business and to be." Part of that moment when they do is is personally really rewarding. Um, outside of the the business world, um, I've taught rock climbing classes, which are you know equally fun. And so many folks will stand at the the bottom of a cliff and look at it and think, "There's no way I can climb to the top of that." And when they get there, um, just that joy and that fun and being part of helping someone, you know, do something they didn't think they could do on their own is uh, is just really 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 rewarding. Well, Mike, uh, this has been rewarding for me. It's been fantastic getting to know you a little bit better. And uh, I want to tell our audience that uh, if they like listening to Mike today, uh, Mike is going to be appearing at our Thrive Connect 20 conference on November 10th and 11th. Uh, so sign up, register for that uh, at thrive.com slash connect. That's T-H-R-Y-V dot com slash connect. And then you'll have an op opportunity to listen to Mike as well as many other great entrepreneurs and speakers. And if you like this podcast, uh, subscribe to our uh, podcast feed 
and uh, pass it along to a friend. And if you have the opportunity, please give us a review. A five-star review is always welcome uh, so that other people can find out about our show. So thanks again, Mike, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Gordon, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much. Same here. This has been Winning on Main Street. We've been speaking with Mike Skitsky. Tune in next week for a discussion with another great entrepreneur. For now, this is Gordon Henry, signing off. 